everyone. I'm uh, happy to see so many people in attendance today. My name is Kai, and I've been working on various aspects of mobile developer platforms and uh, Android integrations for a number of years now. I got started four or five years ago when I joined uh, a startup in Mountain View called Evernote. Many of you may have heard of that. And after working on the Android app for a little while, I discovered my love for uh, working with external developers. So I started working on their SDKs and the different integrations into the app that kind of drove that externally to other partners and people that wanted to integrate. Uh, after a few years there, I joined Twitter, uh, where I was one of the early engineers working on the Fabric developer tools, uh, who just went to Google. Uh, that was pretty fun news to see. And after a couple years there, I, I moved on to Uber, where I am now, uh, continuing to work on the developer platform. Um, for those of you not really familiar with what the development platforms of these companies are doing, they're really the arms of these companies, and sometimes it's a, it's a smaller company that's explicitly focused on developer tooling, external API, docs, developer relations, outreach, and oftentimes the integrations with other partners or OEMs. Today I want to walk you through many of the experiences and features that uh, I've run into and I've built for these various companies. A lot of the learnings I've, I've had building for other developers, specifically on Android. And hopefully that will give you some takeaways for when you want to provide your own app as a platform or if you just want to have a better understanding of what's going on behind the scenes when you integrate against one of these, one of these tools in the wild. Let me first give you a higher level overview of what I mean specifically when I'm talking about mobile developer platforms or Android integrations. A traditional approach on mobile to integrating with the web service may look something like this. You have one device, you have a number of different APKs on the device applications, and they've all bundled the same SDK or libraries or suite of information. They're all making separate network requests up to that same web service. They're all storing potentially cached information about that web service in sandboxed environments. And that has a lot of advantages. It, it means these are completely isolated from each other. A change to one doesn't affect the other. But I view that it has many downsides as well. You know, you have a lot of this duplicate information that I talked about, duplicate connections. And I think that potentially a much more interesting uh, implementation on the device is when you have one application that can serve as the local platform. When you have these first party apps like Evernote, Uber, Twitter, Facebook, that can interact with the other applications on the device for those incoming requests, for proxying really unique uh, UI features that may want to be interacted with. And I think that uh, that can often save a lot of those downsides that uh, I was just describing, the sort of duplicate information store. I think, especially in many parts of the world where bandwidth is a little more conservative, where you don't have unlimited data plans, uh, customers are concerned about spending that data, so not having all those applications, downloading that uh, can be a really big advantage. So let me first walk you through uh, a feature that I built out somewhat recently, um, which was uh, we, we added a more refined set of deep linking to the new rewrite of the Uber app. So here you have a somewhat choppy video, excuse the, uh, the video latency, of moving from one application that initiates a deep link into the Uber app with pre-filled information set on the pickup and the drop-off so that it brings the user right to a spot where they can hit request right and they can move on. You may have seen this in many of your favorite apps. Uh, Facebook has an integration, Google Maps has an integration, uh, Untapped has an integration. You'll see these deep links start to be used uh, quite a lot. But a deep link is really just a URI that your application is registered to handle. So a URI, in this case, we'll, go, we'll talk about the Uber Ride Request URI. It's just, a, it's just a standard HTTP URI. It's a series of parts that communicate the intention of the deep link. In this case, our scheme is Uber. The Android app on the device is registered to handle that so that Android knows where to send that. The authority, in this case, is write request to initiate the specific type of deep link that we want to use. 
And then we append the additional information that we need for the pickup and potentially the drop off uh, as query parameters. Now, when you want to integrate that for an application to handle deep links, these URIs, it's pretty simple. In your intent filter inside of your Android manifest, you would just add uh, this data field and you have the scheme and potentially the authority. And we're going to be a little more tightly bound in this case. We want to, this specific activity, we're calling it write request activity, maybe it's only designed to handle the write request deep link, but there may be plenty of other deep links that are out in the wild and you wouldn't want to throw those to this specific activity. So we've added this additional qualifier, the authority, to handle that here. Now, the deep link specifically on the last slide was a little interesting, but it, it's very specific to Android. And these deep links are a pretty common term that are thrown around. You see them used a lot across the web. You see them used in iOS. But if you're on the web, you, you don't necessarily have something that can handle uber colon slash slash. And so universal links uh, became kind of a de facto way of, of handling that. And the universal link, again, is just a standard HTTP URI. And the data that's provided is the same that came in the last URI that we were looking at. The Android manifest can register to handle this specifically. Uh, we'll get into a, a little bit more of a in-depth use case where we walk through what happens when the app isn't installed in just a moment. And uh, once the, that, that HTTP URI is caught by the Android system and it forwards it over to the Uber app, then we can parse this information out the same that we could the local URI that we were looking at previously. So let's dive in a little bit to what happens when Google Prep isn't installed and the user clicks a link that looks like this. With a standard universal link, a user's in, in the third party application and they, in, they click a link. They have interest in engaging in this behavior that's going to launch another application. So the Android system is going to try to fire this URI. Let's go say, what well, can handle this? Well, if the app's not installed, that's a little bit more of an interesting use case. If the app's not installed, that's going to go to your web server, in our case, m.uber.com, where we can make some assumptions. If we're you know, looking at the user agent, we're on a mobile device, and we've got here, we probably don't have the app installed. And so we're on the server, we will next want to fingerprint the device. We want to look at the user agent, and we want to try to derive some unique information around this. For affiliation information, you know, we might want to get back uh, information to the provider of the deep link around how many users are sending to us, as well as to preserve the intent that the user had when they started the flow. Because what we're going to need, need to do next is we need to send the user from our web service on the mobile device to the Google Play Store. When we do that, we append a refer query parameter. Where we, we're in creating a universal link, you can take that original URL and you could provide that as a URL encoded query. Or perhaps you could save that on your server and generate some sort of unique ID and pass that along as the refer to be acted on later. Once the user installs the application from the Play Store, the Play Store emits a broadcast. That's the uh, install vending, or the install refer broadcast. That's going to be one of the first things that your application sees in its broadcast receiver. And you can parse the intent that came in from that to pull out the information that you stored in the refer query parameter. Now, if you had just URL encoded the original deep link and put that there, you can go ahead and parse that out immediately, uh, decode that, and tell the app to continue on with that flow. That's a much better user experience because the user went from clicking a link with specific intent to do a thing, in our case, take a ride from point A to point B, to install the app, to logging in, to right to where they had intended to go. Now, that's the use case if it's not installed. If it is installed, it's much simpler. The Android system says what can handle this universal link, this HTTP link. The Uber app says, I can handle it. It says, all right, here you go. We parse that and it's the, uh, the, the first use case that we talked about. But, you know, I, one of the things that you may be familiar with on Android is that you have this concept of multiple applications that can handle the intent. So you have this intent picker that pops up. And that 
could provide both the poor user experience, because the user clicked the link and then prompted them, do you want Chrome to open this, or do you want Uber to open this? Potentially, they made a mistake. They clicked Chrome, so then they're going back, and they're trying to reproduce the flow. It's confusing for any user. So in Android Marshmallow, they introduced this term called app linking. App linking allows you to do a couple things on the device and a couple things on your server, and then it tells the Android system that uh, for a specific scheme and authority, that I handle it by default. And the user's not prompted to open it in Chrome or any other potentially malicious app that registers to handle that as well. So let's, uh, let's go through a little bit more of what would be required to implement app linking. In your, in your application, you'll need to make one modification. You'll want to add this auto-verify flag into your intent filter. And when you do that, that tells the Android system to look for these, look for the schemes and the authorities and all the other information, maybe the path that you define there, and try to verify that your application is the one to handle this by default. But any app could potentially just throw an auto-verify it's true. That doesn't really guarantee the security that this app is the official first-party app to handle Twitter links or Evernote links or Uber links. So the second piece of uh, change that you'll need to make, you'll want to use the key tool to use your release key store and extract the public fingerprint that's used on your APK. You'll then store that in an assets links.json that needs to exist up on your primary domain in a web service, specifically referenced in this path here on the screen. Uh, this is in the Android developer docs. Here's a, just a sample of, of how that would look. Now, when your application is installed, newer versions of Android are going to look through the auto-verify. They're going to see that uh, we've registered to handle these Uber links. It's going to look at the domain. It's going to pull down this assets link.json file. It's going to check the public, the public fingerprint against the APK that was just installed. Everything matches up. Now the Uber app can handle that by default. Another common mobile developer platform feature is to integrate authentication to call certain endpoints that you may have in your web service. The Uber API has both privileged and non-privileged scopes depending on the impact of that API endpoint. For example, you may just want to get a ride estimate, uh, a pricing estimate between point A and point B that still may require some authentication, but it's not a super impactful, uh, privileged endpoint. It's not going to make major changes to the user's account. However, let's say that you wanted to actually, through the API, initiate a ride for the user. You know, that's going to cost them money. It's going to bring a car to them. It's a, it's a big deal. And so that's a privileged uh, scope. For the privileged scope, uh, we require a bit more configuration than what you might traditionally see in dealing with getting access tokens back from an authentication. That's commonly referred to as three-legged auth, which is this more secure mechanism for guaranteeing the access tokens that you get back from a web service. Now, at a high level, three-legged auth is this idea that your mobile client has a client ID, and your customer-owned web service has the client secret. And the client ID uh, that mobile application may have an SDK, may use a web view, however it's doing it. It hits a web view for the Uber login service. It says, here's my client ID. And the Uber, uh, the user goes to that web view, they uh, potentially log in, and they approve the access that's, that's being requested, and they are returned an authorization code. Now, the application gets back the code. This is not an access token. It does not grant access to the user's account. The client that needs to hand that access code, that authorization code, up to their server, which has the client secret. Their server then takes the secret, takes the authorization code, and it exchanges those with the Uber API for an access token, and then returns that access token back down to the mobile client so that uh, it can actually use that to make the authenticated requests that need to be made. As you can see, this process to access the privilege scopes requires a bit more configuration, and it can be a little off-putting initially. Fortunately, this is an area that 
can be improved upon. We've improved upon it, and many of your favorite apps also have improved upon this as well. By integrating against the installed Uber app on the device, as opposed to doing it through a web view, often referred to as single sign-on, we can use that app to verify the second piece in the handshake. We can say, we know this is a valid device, we're receiving a client ID, and we can afford to hand back a privileged access token. Now, there are a few ways that I've seen single sign-on built out in the wild before. The most straightforward approach is to use a series of URIs. It's for the third-party application to fire an intent with a URI for logging into the web service. And if the Uber app or whatever privilege app that you're trying to hit is installed and available to handle that, it takes the user into their application and then shows either a web view or a native use to approve the access request. Then on success, the application starts another, the, the first party application, the one being the platform, the provider, throws the redirect URI, which was configured in the customer's uh, setup of their application against some sort of dashboard. And their application that started it is configured to handle that URI. So they started the URI into the Uber app. The Uber app then started another URI back into the third party application with the information that was requested. Another interesting approach is to use a custom action in Android and a bundle full of information to communicate that. And then you start activity for results and on activity result to pass that information back and forth uh, with the user granting approval in the meantime. Now, this is a little more unique of a solution to Android, whereas the first one would have worked on iOS as well, as well as web. Because this requires the custom actions and the intent, and even if you're doing it from the web, you'd have to use an intent URI so that you could know what, the what mobile device you're using. This is also the way that the Twitter app integrated single sign-on. So if you're using the, the Fabric Twitter SDK and using that as single sign-on uh, against the Twitter app, it's using custom actions and bundles. And it was done specifically that way because there were already many legacy clients in the wild, specifically OEM manufacturers that didn't have the luxury of updating, that weren't integrating this from the really early days of, of Twitter. So when I came in and we started working on this, uh, the, the pain of switching that would, would be immense. So uh, because of deprecation reasons, we pushed that out here. Another interesting approach, but a little, little backstory. The third approach is very similar to the second one, but it's to use the platform ordained account manager to handle this flow. Android has a big section on this docs. We'll dive into this in a little bit of, of how you would implement this for a different project I was working on. Um, but it has some, some problems too. It requires you to request extra permissions, both on the consumer of it and on the provider. And in the days before dynamic permissions, uh, that would stop auto update. That still happens on older devices. So it's, it's not necessarily the most straightforward approach. I believe that using URIs and the callback URIs is probably the most standard approach right now. There's even an IEEE RFC out on this for doing native sign-on across applications. So I can see that this will be probably standardized on pretty heavily going forward. Um, but without being able to see the calling application's information, there can be some security concerns here as well. It could potentially allow uh, an external agent to inject a malicious app in the middle of this and present a login view to the user that they think is the Twitter app or the Uber app uh, they put in their credentials and that third party has stolen their information. So uh, we can walk through a couple of, of ways of trying to mitigate those security concerns as well. As you can imagine, that those security concerns should be considered pretty high. Uh, I've seen plenty of bug bounties come across different companies reflecting the login services. So I recommend that both sides of an integration like this specifically set the package that they're wanting to interact with. So you could have any app installed on the device, potentially from a malicious app store that's registering to handle this intent, but it's much less likely that that malicious app also has the same package name as the first party provider, especially since on Android it requires unique package names for each application that's installed. Secondly, and this is a little more complex, you should validate the application's public fingerprints that assign these applications. 
So it's pretty easy to extract the public, public fingerprint. We showed an example with the assets link earlier. And if you do this in both the calling app and the providing app, then you're going to guarantee that not only is the package that you're talking to have the same package name that you expect, but that it's signed by the correct key store that you expect. However, on some older versions of Android, uh, it was possible to generate a, an invalid trust chain and then sign an application with that. And that could take the public cert from a signed application. Let's say I wanted to take Google Maps, so I could take out the public cert from that. I could use that public cert to then sign a single certificate for mine, which is just a generic developer key. And then I could sign my application with that. Now, a common implementation of this was to look at all the certificates that signed an application. This is the trust chain, so it goes all the way back up to the root, and say, hey, uh, do any of these match this expected fingerprint? And you see that exploit I just talked about, and would say, yes, they do. But only one of them did, and it didn't go up to root, uh, which was a problem. It would allow, uh, on older versions of Android and older versions of Google Play services, they updated Google Play services to try to account for this as well. It's still possible to uh, create this sort of man in the middle for uh, stealing authentication information or, or making the apps think that you're a provider and you're not. So a simple implementation you know, on the client, not worrying about what version of Android, is to verify that everything in the certificate chain matches the public fingerprint, not just a single one. So that's what we're doing here. We're saying if any of them do not match, then we have an invalid signature and we should throw an exception or return false or invalidate or whatever your custom logic is going to look like. So moving on to, from some of those more recent projects, I'll talk about a little bit of an older project that I built that was a little more complex, and it had a number of, of integration requirements that we needed to build out. This was the Evernote integration against the Samsung S-Note product. They were bundling Evernote on the device, and they wanted to treat Evernote as the data store. For so people often just create a stub content provider just to implement the sync adapter. And at a high level, it's just a great efficient way for the platform to control syncing your data between your application and the web service that it talks to. And it exposes that sync cycle to the user so they have data transparency in what's going on by your application and they can disable syncing if potentially they're on, not on a network where they want to use that data. Since the system optimizes running this already when the device may be waking up or when other applications are syncing, it's much more efficient for you to be syncing your data regularly using this than when you're trying to do it independently. And it reduces the number of weight loss, so in general your users are gonna have a little better battery life. And it can be provided and accessed via third-party applications, which was really important in our integration with Samsung because they needed to be able to kick off the sync or see if the specific content that they created was up to date with the web service. And in addition to uh, the interval scheduling, it's also great at working with, with uh, I have GCM here, but it's you know, Firebase push messaging at this point. Um, it, can, it can respond to tickles and do automatic syncing based on that. To implement a sync adapter, we would just need to subclass the abstract threaded sync adapter. And the most important method here is the on-perform sync, where we would grab out the accounts from the account manager, and uh, if there were multiple accounts, we could do this in parallel. And this is not running on the main thread automatically, so we don't need to worry about blocking it. And in this example, we can maybe request some images and store those on disk, and then we call that sync. We also need to create a service for the sync adapter to bind to, so that it runs in the same process as the main application, and it can get access to the resources uh, and, and other account information that might be needed. After creating the job class, we need to create a metadata class that lives under ResXML that defines the sync adapter. And here we're specifying the authority and the account type that we want to use with this, as well as some additional flags, like its ability for parallel syncs, which may be more useful if you had multiple accounts in your application. And to wrap that up, we just need to add that service to our Android manifest, and then to ensure that we include the metadata and the sync adapter that we just created, and that wires that all up for automatic sync. Now that we've got the seeking working, how often should we do that? Well, you may be thinking, uh, how about we poll once an hour? And 
you know, maybe granted that's quite ambitious, your application isn't used that often, you don't need hourly data syncs, so you might want to pump that out more. But regardless, let's say that an hour was how often you needed to sync. You'd be tempted to implement something like this in the sync adapter. And if you did, then probably a little bit after deploying and your user started using this, you might have some very angry person from your DevOps team come to you and uh, show you a graph that looks something like this. It turns out that most carriers uh, send down a tickle on the hour to, for the heartbeat of the device, and that's a wake, wake lock. The syncing interval says, oh, it's, we're syncing on the hour. This is probably a good time to kick this off. And now you have, if you have millions of users, you potentially have millions of people hitting your server around the same time, spiking a lot of traffic, kind of DDoSing yourself. So here's a slightly varied approach where we, very similar to the past slide, except we added some random time for a jitter. Now this creates a much more natural distribution over time, where we don't get that, that spike. Now, another way to do inter-process communication, aside from the content provider and the intents, and something that we needed for the Samsung project, was uh, we needed a communication layer that we could pass serialized objects directly back and forth between different processes or applications. And that's where binding services came into play. And if you're not super familiar with that, then um, you would define an AIDL. It's an Android interface, interface definition language. This is just a, a, a lightweight stub that generates interfaces that you extend. You then have these concrete implementations on both sides, and you can pass information back and forth. If you're familiar with uh, Thrift or Protobuf or something else where you're generating these, these objects, it feels similar, um, but these classes do need to be parsable when you're passing them back and forth but you do get the advantages of a consistent interface that you can call directly between processes or applications after you've bound to the service. Now, it does allow you to directly call these methods, and it can be quite powerful. Um, in our case, it's, it's what we needed to share some of the account information, but if you don't have the same concrete implementation, that can cause exceptions that cause hard crashes. So let's go over uh, a sample implementation of an AI deal. Here, we're going to create a service that can pass a message back and forth between two processes. First, we define the AIDL with the methods that we want to use. Uh, the type support includes primitives as well as the parsable classes that I mentioned. And then we're going to implement that AIDL uh, generated stub. And on our specific example here, we're just going to log the message. We don't care to do more than that. And then we need to expose the remote service by returning the binder and the on binder. So any consumer who attaches receives the implementation that we designated. Now, the service will capture the result, so you get the same value each time. So you can never return, for example, null if the service wasn't quite ready to attach yet, because every subsequent call will still return null. Finally, we can consume the remote service in another app by setting up a service connection. It receives the callbacks for connected and disconnected, and so we can know what methods, when we can call the methods on the service. We need to initiate binding and unbinding of that uh, service connection based on the lifecycle in on resume and on pause, the services or activities. And what's funny about on service disconnected is that it, it doesn't do what you think it would do. It only gets called if there was an unexpected exception in the remote service that you found it. So that's never going to happen on its own. You need to explicitly null out your service after you've unbound from it. Now, we've talked about a lot of features today. We haven't really covered the privacy concerns of interact communication. So I want to give you like a little bit of a breakdown on the permission model of Android, of uh, how it can relate here. The first goal of the model that Android has in general is, is just to inform the user. And this is the, the oldest version of permissions where you saw all of them on the install. The user read the permissions and hit, I agree to these. And every update after, if you wanted to add new permissions, it would stop auto update. Now, most users don't read dialogues, so there was a lot of bad actors in the App Store. Now we have these dynamic permissions, which are a little bit nicer. But by limiting application access to sensitive information, the intention is that if your app does get exploited, it doesn't necessarily have the ability to damage the user that much, so it mitigates the exploits. So the Android permission levels fall into four categories. Uh, the normal permissions, 
They can't really impart harm to users. This is something like they can change the wallpaper, but uh, while asking to request them, they're automatically granted. Dangerous permissions can impart real harm to users. They can call a phone number, they can access the address book, and the apps need, and users explicitly need to approve these. The signature is a permission that's designed so that suite, a suite of an app, so that apps that are all signed by the same uh, signature, same key store, can talk to each other, but apps that are not signed by that signature cannot. And they automatically get this. And lastly, signature system is a fourth level of permission, which is explicitly designed for OEMs. It's like signature, where they're going to be signed by the same key store and talking to each other, but they can also be talked to by system apps. So this allows a company like Samsung to push out an app that's a uh, not a system app through the Play Store, but it's signed by the same key store, and so it can interact with uh, system level permissions that other apps would not be able to. Android gives us the ability to declare our own permissions as well. Today we've talked about some of the custom ones, but we would also maybe want to create our own in dealing with uh, these systems as well. They must be provided by the recipient app and declared by the calling app to grant the permission. And if they're dangerous, then the user needs to explicitly grant permission as well. Now, these can be enforced programmatically uh, in, in Java, or they can be done in XML also. All right, got a couple more slides. We're running out of time. Uh, here's a quick example on how we might enforce this programmatically. Uh, we would just check the Java. Um, unfortunately, check calling yourself permissions can leak permissions for the calling activity. So, or the calling process, so be aware of that. And if we wanted uh, to enforce the permissions in XML, well, we can do it very similarly um, on all the components we talked about, but I'm only showing a specific one with the content provider here. All the others can be done similarly, so look those up. The requirements that we all talked about were all covered by the components today, so let's talk a little bit about how that was done. We have the get notes, which was covered by both the intent of the content provider, depending on if it was a single note or a batch of notes. The list notes were covered by intents. The create, compose, and updating notes were all covered by intents in the content provider, again, depending on the single use case or the batch size. Deleting notes, we could use the intent of the content provider again. The account syncing was solved by using the account manager and the sync adapter. And the, for getting specific preferences, we were able to use the AIDL and the content provider to communicate back and forth. Now, although these are rewarding integrations, they're often very difficult to debug. In my experience, many of these integrations are device specific, like with manufacturer cameras. And switching between these apps can be very difficult to figure out what's going on since you can't put debug points in all of them. So with that challenge, good logging is incredibly important. And setting up mock integrations, things that uh, use your API in an automated way, is very useful in testing this as well. But not all, not all of these are local APIs on Android, so it's really important to communicate these interfaces to your customers through non-standard means, like uh, better device documentation. Uh, even consider having uh, an open beta channel to get some of this information. And, and that helps you get more user feedback so that you can really improve on these. Because they feel like magic when they work well, but they feel really bad and wonky when they break down, uh, when it's, the user doesn't know exactly what this is breaking between two applications. Lastly, rely on great tools to collect this data from the wild. Things like uh, Fabric and Firebase analytics and crash reporting. That'll give you the information that you need for monitoring your stability on these in the wild. Uh, I hope you had some great takeaways from this talk today. Uh, I'm really excited to see more apps in the wild that integrate closely to each other on Android. If you'd like to explore more of the recent integrations that we've been working on in Uber, check out the developers.uber.com. Uh, we have our docs there. We have more coming soon. Um, and we're always hiring if you think this sort of stuff is exciting to work on. Uh, I don't have any time for questions, but thank you all for coming.